Okay. Um, all right. Last talk of the day. Uh, Tim Yao Tang will be speaking on dihedral rigidity. Also, fill in in space time called it a mass. Yeah. Or when is the square a square? Yeah, <laughs> the title. Yeah. And then I mean, uh, it is. I mean, it's actually a joke. The real title is the following. Yeah, because, <laughs> because I told crystals, every time I do a presentation, I will upgrade it. <laughs> Next time will be heptagon. Yeah, OK. And then pentagon, and then hexagon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so today I will talk about, first of all, the IGOG conjecture, and we'll see the recent progress. I will focus on the part that is done by Charlie. Then from this, we can see how to see this further from Charlie's motivation. And then we can see Gormoth-Fulling conjecture. And then uh, in between, I will also talk about quasi local mass and positive mass theorem with corners with corners. There is not a typo, and we will see why. So, in two dimensional scenario, of course, we have the beautiful Gauss Bonnet theorem. So, here K stands for the Gauss curvature, copper stands for the geodesic curvature, and the upper J stands for the interior angles. Yeah. So, we can tell, for example, a triangle on a sphere, a triangle plank, they have different angles already. So, what does it mean? The angles correspond to curvature. So it's just a simple picture to illustrate this. And then from the other point of view, we can see the following. Given a polygon, if any of the inequality is fixed, for example, the geodesic curvature is positive somewhere on the boundary, or the angle is more than equal to the one in the Euclidean model, then we can tell that this sigma g cannot admit non-negative Gauss curvature. So we can tell from the shape of it, we can know the interior cannot have any SC, which is a C2 quantity. So it is pretty amazing. So what happens in higher dimensions? So let P be a convex polyhedron in Rn. A compact Riemann manifold with boundary is said to be of type P if there exists a polyhedral diffeomorphism. So which means that because overall, right, the, polyhe the polyhedron itself has angles, has corners, and vertices. So uh, what does it mean is that when this is to the interior of the face, interior of the polyhedron, and the interior of the edges, the map will be smooth. So to characterize scalar curvature instead of Gauss curvature because it's high dimension, right? Gormoth proposes a following conjecture. So given a manifold of type P, if M has non-negative scalar curvature, if each face of the boundary has non-negative mean curvature, and the diagonal angles are everywhere less than or equal to the corresponding ones of P, then the manifold itself must be isometric to Euclidean polyhedron. And because I'm bad at drawing pictures, there is a very typical example. So now it is flat. So when I blow it, so you can see the expanding. You can see each face mean convex, and the angle is definitely bigger. So it is. So this conjecture is easy to see, but very difficult to prove. Yes, the yeah. Yes, and luckily, <laughs> and luckily, I mean Charlie shows up and he has uh, done amazing work. I mean, for the following five to ten minutes, I will talk about Charlie's approach. So if you have questions, please ask him. Don't ask me. Yeah, yeah. So let's. The dimension between two and seven, P be at Euclidean prism with diagonal angles at most power two. And if n is equal to three, actually P3 can be arbitrary simplex. I assume M is a reminder for the H of type P. Then the diagonal G conjecture holds for M. So make it more quantitatively. Scalarature, non-negative, mean curvature, non-negative. And the angle is more than the one in the Euclidean model, then it's isometric to Euclidean polyhedron. Okay? Then first of all, I mean uh, I'll focus on the prism case for the prism case. So first of all, we may assume the angle, right, because so it's more than equal to. But we can say it is equal to by Gormoth-Smith argument, which is shown as the following. Say, for example, here. For example, it's the original angle. Then we can bend it inward so that the angle definitely increases. The angle increases, and then the mean curvature, you can see, is more convex. So the mean curvature increases, while the scalar curvature assumption it's preserved because it's the interior of the original manifold. So that's why it's called open arguments. It will make our life easier. And then we will look for a dimension reduction. So we'll look for an omega tilter which achieves the following. Let me draw a picture here. Oh, sorry. Okay, say, say the top, bottom, side faces. Then we'll look, for, look from the top. Say there's omega. And we want to minimize the part which is highlighted here, the boundary omega and the interior of M. So this area, if we have this minimizer, then this surface will call it sigma. This is automatically a free boundary minimal surface. So that's why I should draw it this way, free boundary minimal surface. Then 
uh, because we have to do some analysis on it. So uh, by geometry measure theory, by Taylor, Simon, and Adam and Lee, we know that C1 alpha, and for higher dimensional, because of the uh, angle assumption, so we know that it's C2 alpha regular, C2 alpha regular, by something like PD by Lieberman. And then on this particular metric, because it is induced, by right, induced metric, one will consider the conformal change by the first eigenfunctions of the Jacobi operator. And after this, we can analyze through all the angle assumption or the curvature assumption, we can tell that actually, after the conformal deformation, this one, actually we can tell this flat, it's flat. Moreover, actually, again, you trace through all the inequalities, you can tell the phi equal constant. So what does it mean? It means that the G induced on sigma itself is flat. It's actually flat itself. So it is good. The next step is the following. By uh, perturbation results by uh, Carlotto, Chodos, Ishmael, we would do a perturbation on the annulus like this. Yeah. So they can then generate another minimizer. Say, let me use another color here. Which on the annulus, so when you adjust the size of the annulus, you can tell this yellow surface will be closer and closer to the orange surface. So what does it mean? It means that we have a dense foliation of flat surfaces. And then we can further show on these surfaces by the first variation of the second parallel form. So we can tell the Riemann curvature tensor actually vanishes. So which means that the Riemann curvature tensor is densely zero. But G is C2 alpha, right? So which means overall the Riemann curvature must be zero on this prism. So this is flat. So this is the idea. And then for a very special scenario, for example, three-dimensional for a cube case, as motivated by Stern's how the one from level sets method, then Chai has found this uh, formula. So let mg this time, this time is a cube with the angles is exactly powerful to everywhere. So in this scenario, the, we can solve for harmonic function, which satisfy the following. U equal to one on top, the richlet, zero on the bottom, and then this one for the Neumann boundary condition. So for this, we can tell that by the integral formula, we have this. In particular, the second line of this, because we assume the alpha g is perfect too, which means the second line is zero. So E in particular, if the curvature is non-negative, mean curvature is non-negative, then we know that the Hessian U would be zero. So Hessian U vanish, what does it mean? Which means gradient U is parallel. And then we can choose three orientations so that a three-dimensional manifold admitting three parallel fields, it must be flat. So it's done, we can tell it is isometric to a Euclidean rectangular solid or cube point. Yeah. And then what we can do further regarding the uh, diagonal conjecture. So Charlie has also mentioned that if we con assume a scale of Shalua bound, then when we consider, because I mean uh, up to scale then, right? We can see the scale pressure can be greater than equal to negative n times n minus one. So we should compare that to the hyperbolic model. So we can see as a upper half space model, if M this time is a remaining polyhedron model on C1 times a P, where P this time is a polyhedron on which the dihedral conjecture as previously mentioned holds, then what you can do is that assuming the curvature is greater than a one in the hyperbolic space, the mean curvature on the top is greater than M minus one, the bottom is greater than negative of M minus one, and then on the side faces, the mean curvature is not negative. Over again, the Dijon angles assumption is more than or equal to one corresponding in the uh, hyperbolic space. Then we can tell that this manifold must be isometric to a parabolic prism in the hyperbolic space. So the idea of proof is exactly the same, but this time we are not only considering minimizing the area. This time we want to, we want to uh, <coughs> minimize the function which is as follows, which is the area of the boundary of omega. So it's an area, but this time we have to add extra term. So we can expect that if the minimizer exists, there will be a CMC surface. And again, the perturbation result, we can have a dense relation CMC, we can again consider variation of the second form form, then we have information for the Riemann curvature tensor, then it's done. Okay. 
So up to up to up to this step, you may see oh Charlie has done all the things. Then what 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 we can do, right? Then before that, okay, let's see another concept. That's the initial data sets. So given the initial data set M G K. So I mean, uh, Warren has given a nice talk about this. So but I will just a brief introduction here. So M G is a reminder manifold. K this time stands for the second final form of this slice in the space time. So this is called initial data set because it's an initial data set for a Cauchy problem. Which is to construct a Lorentzian manifold such that G bar will satisfy the Einstein equation. And then there exists an isolation embedding for mg into m bar g bar. And this time, as again I mentioned, key is a single form of, form of m is for the m bar. So let me fix some notations at this moment. So given the two sided surface in a I mean, sub manifold, in a you know, MB manifold, I will define second form, of form in this way. Such that the chase of it will be called mean curvature. And you have a positive sign, with, I mean, for example, in the Euclidean space for the just a sphere with respect to our normal, you have positive mean curvature. So it's just a sign convention, not much special. The sigma will be called a minimal surface if the mean curvature vanishes on this surface. But now, if you also take k into consideration, the sigma will be called a marginal inner trap surface if h plus k sigma k vanishes. A marginal inner trap surface if h minus k sigma k vanishes. So the meaning of this uh, marginal trap surface is the following, because H stands for the variation with respect to the space like normal, and then K stands for the variation with respect to the time like normal. What to get the space like and time like is mean the light direction. So it means that along the light direction, there is not much variation. In a sense that even the lights cannot escape. So it has a model for apparent horizon. And finally, we will define pi tensor which is k minus chase k times g is called the conjugate momentum tensor. And it's very important. We will see this uh, actually a lot of times in the coming 30 minutes. So after we know what is mgk, then we can define the mass density mu and current density j. They are defined as follows. Mu is exactly the g0, 0, 0. G is the Einstein tensor. And j is the g0i. Of course, 0 here means a time like unit normal. And the normal energy condition is satisfied if mu is greater than the norm of j. But then we are only considering, considering the industrial set, right? That's why we have to use Gauss equation and Kodai's equation to express those quantities completely in terms of industrial sets. So this is the formula. And j here again will be so pi source up again. This is the divergence of pi of the conjugate momentum. Yeah. So let me write something down here. So let me remember mgk corresponding to pi, and then we have mu, and then we have g. Okay, these are the quantities. So now uh, we have some information. We are ready to ask the generalization of those diagonal g condition results. So first of all, we, we consider mg itself as mg0. Then we can tell that the dormant condition I mean, at this moment, I consider three dimensions. So, I mean, the curvature will be non negative. If we consider the hyperbolic space as an umbilic initial data set in Minkowski space, then MGG corresponds to curvature greater than negative six. So, what about MGK in general? Then we should expect that we should have dormancy condition, right? And then the question is what could be the comparison models? Yeah. And then the next thing is from Charlie's proof, we know that, right? If you have foliation of certain surfaces, you will be amazing. We have rigidity results. result. So for the uh, MGCO case, you have the free boundary minimal surfaces, H equals zero, which means the chase of the zero. Or in hyperbolic space, we have the chase of the G, which in this time, the same form is G. So it's plus or minus two. So this time, we shall expect it should be most or miss, which means we want to see H equals plus or minus chase in K. But the question is, how can we seek one? Because we can see for minimal surface and CMC, we can minimize a certain function law. But as we know, I mean, most and miss, they do not come from variational problem. So that's why it is very hard to produce one. And then secondly, what about the boundary assumptions? Because as we can tell, right, even for the hyperbolic scenario, the mean curvature assumption is a little bit more complicated. So what about MGK in general? Moreover, is there a Gormos-Bending argument? So that's make, uh, making our life easier. And the, 
I mean, my answer for the last one is no, because I mean, for open argument, just concern the metric or the geometry G itself. It doesn't take K into consideration. So I don't think there will be one good bending argument. But luckily, we don't have to use this global bending argument. That is one good thing. So now it's time to introduce space sum functions. So motivate by Stern, first cousins create proposed space sum functions, which is defined as this. The question you, this time you have to add an extra term plus chase of k times the normal gradient u equal to zero. So this is a particular lemma. So I mean, I can do it on the prism scenario. So mgk this time is a C1 times p0, where p0 this time is a q-sided polygon, q-sided polygon. And then all diagonal angles are everywhere is more than pi. Say for example, the base, the p0 can be like this. And then overall, the, the, the product, I mean the p itself, c1 times p0 can be something like this at this moment. If we were less than pi, then we can have the existence of a space time function of this particular regularity. And moreover, the angle here, they do not have to be fixed. I mean, they can be varied. So somehow it's curved. I mean, sometimes the angle is narrower, sometimes it's bigger. As long as overall every is more than pi, then we have existence of this space time function. So equal one on top, equal to zero on the bottom. And for the side face, again, normal boundary condition. But then, as we compare this result to Chai's result, we can tell that because of the flexibility of the polyhedron that we are considering, we sacrifice some regularity. So you can tell, I mean, apart from the edges, then W3P local is good. Globally, it's only CCO alpha. So there is something we have to deal with. But then at this moment, let me take some time to talk about, we say we have a function, okay. <laughs> Uh, up to my analysis, this is the best I can do. I don't know what, I mean, yeah, my, my limited ability to do analysis, but you will see under certain small, I mean, un, under certain extra assumption, you will be useful. I would say you will be useful. It might not be optimal, but you will be useful at least. Yeah, yeah, we will see. And then let me introduce a level set method. Right? Give, say we have such a function, what we can do, right? why do we care about that function? So Stern suggests a new approach to study three-dimensional topology, in particular concerning scalar curvature. Then correspondingly, his work with Bray considered the manifold with a boundary, and then Hurst Cousins curve is considered as asymptotic fast in those sets. And altogether five key ingredients. First of all, Doppler formula. Secondly, the Shinya rearrangement on the Gauss equation of a regular level set. I mean because it's regular value level set, so that's why uh, gradient is not missing, so that's why the term makes sense. Okay, what I highlight here is the mean curvature square and the norm of the second malform squared. So why I highlight them? Because just for the recognition, we have to remember this one. Maybe it will be useful. Let me write down here, actually. But on a regular level set, say it is a level set, then we're back to this normal, n equal to gradient u, the norm of gradient u. And the second power form is this one. Hessian u, which is on a tangent sigma, divided by the norm of gradient u. And then on a regular value level set, over the gradient of the norm of gradient u would just be the Hessian u eating the normal vector. So it will be one form. Okay. And then we will denote this second power form by h, corresponding to h. Okay. And then finally, this is just for uh, recognizing the terms and define the space time Hessian tensor as follows. Hessian bar u equal to Hessian u plus the gradient u and the k tensor, part of k tensor. Then what you can do with these five ingredients? First of all, just consider the Laplace of long gradient u. Then by direct computation, I mean direct computation is here. Then for the first term, we can use the Bordner formula. So we get Vichy term. From the Vichy term, then of course, first of all, we have the ambient curvature. We have the level set scalar curvature. Then for the ring term, that's why I say I have to recognize them. Then I can organize this in this way. Then after a bunch of recognition, I may just have to identify which term is which term. Then we have a beautiful formula as follows. So for space time function, the Laplacian you plus chase k times gradient equals zero. First of all, by integration by part, then we get the first line, first equal sign. And then by covariant formula, we can tell that, okay, the second line is useful. 
Because first of all, at this moment, we can tell that mu and j shows up, which means something we got an energy condition that we can play with. And then with the scalar curvature on the level set, which means hopefully we can use Gauss-Muller theorem to tell us the information from the dihedral angle, right? Okay. So this is a lemma, and this is the red highlighted part is the uh, how to make the harmonic function useful. So let MGK be of type, again, this is C1 times a polygon, where the diagonal angles, if you're less than pi, so they have existence of the space harmonic function. Then we further assume that the diagonal angles between the top face and the side faces. So let me draw it here. Again, this is good for existence. But then for V to have this integral formula, I have to further assume this one. Say for example, top phase, and then the bottom phase, side phase. This angle has to be less than power two. I mean less than or equal to power two. Then we can have this integral formula making sense. So at this moment, we can observe that mu and J shows up in the interior part of M manifold. And then on the boundary, H and pi shows up. The conjugate momentum shows up. So there is a key, H and pi shows up. And of course, for the last line is the diagonal angle GT, my diagonal angle assumption that will be useful. And then the key of this formula to show the following, the integration by pi is making sense. Again, the, uh, the regularity is so bad because we have too much flexibility in the prism. So for the regularity, it's very ugly, but then we have to do it very carefully. For example, on the faces, why the integral is making sense because of the derivatives and the normal boundary and the normal boundary conditions. For the vertices, we can use a weighted shutter estimate or estimate of scaling to talk about when we oppose the vertices, then it's making sense. And then for the vertical edges, we can use Lippmann's result to say something about the regularity. And then the most horrible part, really, really horrible part is the horizontal edges. So let me emphasize here. So we call this one. On this side face side, it is Neumann condition. And then for the bottom face or the top face, it's a division condition. So for this scenario, and moreover, the angle that we're considering is just less than equal power two. So somehow it might be powerful to somewhere, less than powerful to somewhere. It turns out that the tricky point is that if it's everywhere power two, then just by reflection, we can get C2 alpha regularity. If it's strictly less than power two everywhere, then we have C1 alpha regularity, and it will be useful, respectively. But if it is power two somewhere, less than power two somewhere, then it is very tricky. Of course, you may expect, okay, C1 alpha plus C2 alpha equal to C1.5 alpha, which is, which is useful, right? But it turns out that it is not. It is definitely not the case. And by a result by Schrodinger and Lee Wang, it tells us, it turns out that it is merely Lipschitz. Actually, I mean, sorry, it's a Lipschitz, slightly better Lipschitz. This is differentiable, classically differentiable Lipschitz, but not C1 alpha. So we have to use a blob argument and, with, and use it with a contradiction to some classic regularity results in the boundary hand inequality. We can tell that, okay, the integral is still making sense when we oppose the horizontal edges. So it somehow it's like, yeah, okay. Oh, I mean, this one is, uh, they prove that if it's strictly less than the power of 2 is C1 alpha. But if it goes between pi over 2 and less than pi over 2. It's merely differentiable. Lipschitz and differentiable, but not C1 alpha. Oh, yes, it's a Li and Wang paper. Yeah, yeah, not C1, not even C1. Yeah. So it's merely differentiable. Yeah, so this is uh, very tricky. So somehow it's like cooking, right? When you have two ingredients, which is very good, respectively, but when you mix them up, it may not be a good dish. Okay, so at this moment, we know that, okay, we have the integral formula. What we can do, what we can do. From the observation, we can tell that, right? In the remaining cases done by Chai for cube case, Hessian U vanishing takes a very important role. Then here, of course, we may expect from the formula, uh, the Hessian bar U, we want it to, van we want it to vanish. We want this to, to vanish. But what it says, by definition, by the defining the space Hessian tensor, it tells you that. That's K. In particular, let me restrict them on tangent sigma. In particular. So it tells that, that part here, right? The second final form, 
plus the k visual and tangential sigma part is zero, which means each level set is a totally space-time geodesic mode. And foliation by mods, which means each mod must be stable. And then we can use result by Anderson, Mass, Simon, Galloway, Shing, and Galoto on stable mods. We can have some information like the each level set will have Gauss curvature finishing. But then I mean, it's because we bound you, right? Then we have to be more uh, careful. So that I have to use the result by Gil, like Martin, and Yao on the stable category mods, which concern about the boundary case as well. So, first of all, let me talk about what is the meaning of stable mods. So for two sudden modes, let phi be a function on it and n be a continuous unilateral vector field on this. And of course, I mean if we just high chase in the KY, right? just the main curvature. They're just a Jacobi operator. But now with the K here, this is more complicated. But overall, it's a more stable operator, and we have the definition corresponding to this operator. Yep. And this again by Argyl, Martin, and Yao. So a free boundary, because they talk about capital mods, but in our scenario, we only concern free boundary case. So I quote part of the definition here. A free boundary mod is stable with respect to the relation of the field, x equal phi n, if, of course, it's had to satisfy Warburn boundary condition, which means the partial phi, partial, I mean, this is the uh, normal data of phi, it just satisfy a certain condition. Here, pi is as following, because this is the level set, right? Pi is the second power form with respect to the outward normal. Or parcel m. This pi. Again, for the level sets, the normal vectors is divided by n and sigma over h. For the partial m to m is nil and pi, correspondingly. So first of all, open boundary condition. Moreover, the variation along the vector field h plus chi sigma k has to be non-negative. Again, because we know that the level is folded by mods, that quantity must be zero. What we mean to check is the following. Right. Because the level set flow, which means x must be 1 by norm greater than u times n. Then just by direct computation, we can tell it satisfies the Warburg boundary condition. In particular, it means that each mod is really a stable free boundary mod. So it's good, very good. So now we can really arrive at the dihedral rigidity part. So first of all, let MGK be a certain set, again, of the type P of C1 times P0. I can satisfy the dihedral angle assumption that we have previously mentioned, like this one, yeah, yeah. And then in the interior, we have to assume the dominant G condition. Well, on the top, we only have to assume H is greater than the balance of chase of K on the surface. On the bottom, H is greater than the chase of K on the surface. Well, on the side faces, we have to assume that the mean curvature greater than the norm of the pi eating nil for the tangential part only. Again, pi is a conjugate momentum. But it's very important, we will see why they show up. Because at this moment, right, you may say, well, it is so artificial. But I mean, in, uh, in the later parts of the talk, we will see, actually, they are very natural. So first of all, by the assumption, just a, OK. Yeah, just a quick question. So Good. Um, right, the, uh, the analog of Rommel would be like h plus trace k sigma is not negative on every face. Not really. Yeah, I will. Yeah, this is, this is a part I'm really excited about in a certain sense. Yeah, I will tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then first of all, here is the, uh, uh, first of all, it's a comparison theorem. Comparison theorem. Because we have not talked about the, which is, I mean, we have not assumed that the angle is everywhere less than the one in Euclidean model. So first of all, a comparison theorem. Let theta j be the suit of the diagonal angle on each vertical edges. Then we can have the sum of those uh, suit would be greater than q minus 2 times pi, which means the diagonal angles of the prism cannot be everywhere less than the one of p, I mean the, the model, right? the comparison theorem. Then if we further assume the diagonal angles of m are everywhere less than or equal to those of p, then first of all, all the energy condition or the boundary condition, the inequality will become equality expected. And then moreover, we know that diagonal angles between the top and the side faces and the bottom and surfaces will actually be power two. It is shown by the non vanishing of the gradient U. Yeah, so it's except power two. And moreover, as we have discussed, the free sum is fully by the level set. Each level set is totally space and geodesic. And moreover, on each level set, mu plus j times the normal vector must be zero. And moreover, because of our energy con condition, we can further show that actually 
the geodesic curvature of each colorful set is zero. And altogether, because angle is the same as the original P0, and then Gauss curvature is zero, geodesic curvature is zero. Altogether, each level set is isometric to the polygon P0 up to scaling. Then in corollary, we can tell already the diagonal for P sums for MGCO case and the MGG case. So it cover, we cover the, the thing. But I mean, it may be a little bit abstract, so let's do uh, one example. Sorry, I already okay. forgot the beginning. Oh, which one? Summarize which? the whole thing again. Oh, first of all, the comparison field. Yep. Oh, well, this is still not, this is the beginning of the level, right? Oh, yeah, it's an assumption, and then yeah, this is the result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Take some time. I might be, yeah, sorry, I might be yeah. too fast. Yeah. yeah. Hmm, let's say. Yeah. Actually, also in your paper, if you, if you discover this, it's a test for you. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I mean, you should recognize this, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, five minutes later, you will see the answer. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, okay, it's assumption. This page yeah. is assumption. Then this part, that's why I pause it. Right? This part is a comparison favor. Then it's a dihedral rigidity. Let me, at least from the rigidity, what you can tell. Because we further assume the angles. But right? for the, this part, we don't assume the angles to be. I mean, is it okay then? Or... Uh, this is a comparison favor. Okay. It's, just, it's just like the first part of Charlie's paper. I mean, in 2017 paper, the first part, comparison favor. Then the second part is a rigidity. I mean, yeah, yeah. So let's see what happens. So if MGCO is too simple, then we can see the MGG. Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, I mean, let me uh, it. let me yeah, it. Okay, so first of all, it's a foliation. I mean, we are considering a hyperbolic case. Let's see what happens. So it's a foliation by level sets. Of course, we can write it in this way. Moreover, because each level set is uh, Euclidean, we know it's a flat. That's why you can write this way. Phi is a, just a function, depends on the foliation. So phi t. And gradient u will be constant. And this is a very important, important in the hyperbolic case. Why? Because say x, a vector field, belongs to the level set, tangential level set. Then by the recognition, by right, this term I mentioned in the beginning, the recognition, what is it? It's actually the Hessian U eating the normal and X. But then by the vanishing of the space time Hessian tensor, when it's normal, when it's tangential, that's why it must be zero. And because green is constant, we can change the term the following way. We parameterize T to S. Then now, because it is CMC foliation, so just by solving this ODE, Done. It is the hyperbolic metric, right? So this is how we do the things. I mean, this is for MGC or of course MGC is more difficult. So I show it up here. So this is idea. So at this moment, you may ask, oh, I mean, you still have not solved the MGK in general, right? You just solve MGC or MGG. So what you can do about MGK in general? So here is a theorem. one. So let MGK be initial sets of cube time, which simultaneous by the dominant condition and the boundary dominant condition. And then everywhere, the larger angle between two phases of M is less than equal to power of two. You accept a cube, I'm comparing it to a cube. Then we can tell MGK can be isometrically embedded in the Minkowski space with the boundary isometric to the boundary of a Euclidean rectangular prism. So here, the boundary dominant condition is a thing. So we can tell, let me write that here first. And again, we will see this later, I promise. So here, mu j. Here, H. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, before the proof, I want to emphasize it's a CSO characterization of the damage condition. So, which means that MGK cannot simultaneously satisfy the dominant energy condition, the boundary dominant condition, and all the joint angles of air cubes. It is impossible. As you can tell, when you blow into the box of juice, right, they expand it everywhere. So it is impossible. So it will be impossible. So now let's go to the proof. First of all, this time because wait, 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 wait. okay. Um, so this, this just gives a uh, proof of the initial data set in the community in dimensions three. 
Yeah, because it's a harmonic function approach at this moment. So I can tell it is only in dimension three. Yes, you're right. Sure, sure. But, it, but it gives you everything. Yeah. What do you mean by everything? Uh, what do you want? Yeah. The, the inequality e is greater than p, and the equality e equal to p. Oh, I zero, I see. Zero. I see. That's what I mean by everything. Okay, so I would say it definitely implies space time Poisson theorem. I mean the inequality. For the equality, I have to think about it. I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. But it definitely gives you equal than the norm of P. Definitely. But like, I mean, I'm, okay, maybe we can talk about this after. But oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would love to do this. Okay, first of all, by symmetry, this time, I, again, we can solve for just like three space time the functions, three directions. Then, of course, we know that right this time, by the symmetry, we got the second final form of the boundary, k restricted on the boundary, and then the pi new one form will vanish it on the boundary. Moreover, again, because each phase turns out to be a level set, which means each phase is actually flat, they have Gauss coefficient zero. And because we have two space time functions, which means, I mean, u and w, they are two different directions for space time function, the gradient vector. And by all the arguments, we can tell that j must be vanishing, which means mu must be vanishing. So up till this moment, what you can tell is that mu and j is zero. But it is, what does it mean? It's vacuum. Vacuum doesn't mean it is necessarily a uh, Minkowski space, right? So we have to do something further. We have to do that. Okay. So this time I will change the gear a little bit to talk about the global thing, the space time Poisson mass field. So as in the factors, I mean, again, as uh, talk about, it is introduced by uh, Unger yesterday. So in order to set MGK, this is in fact, if outside compact set, it looks like just an Euclidean minus a ball. And then the metric will decay to Euclidean metric. The K will be vanishing. I mean, it will converge to zero and infinity. Of course, up to some technical assumptions. And we have to further assume mu and j is integrable. So that we can define the following quantities. That is the ADM energy momentum vector. So E is defined as this, and P is defined as that. But once it's, what we want to see is that, OK, E is measuring how the metric is behave is I mean how the metric behaves at the sphere of infinity, and p is measuring how the conjugate momentum behaves at the infinity. And this definition is useful because by the equation independently prove that it is independent of the choice of the f coordinates. Of course, I mean pi itself, of course, change with the coordinate, but altogether as a vector itself, right, use is independent of the choice. So uh, we know mgk pi, we know mu j, now we know e and p. Well, what we can do with the positive mass field? So let mgk be an asymptotic flat in this set. If the dormant condition is satisfied, then e must be greater than the norm of p. And if e equal p, then e equal p equals zero, and mgk is a slice of the entire space. I mean, this term, of course, I mean, most people here express, but yeah, I mean, just assume that we don't know this, but see a slightly so called counter example. Just take our uh, compass set of R3, and we have this metric. Of course, it definitely is because it fits in K just vanishing. Then mu, by definition, just by direct computation, right, it's just zero. And then J, because K vanishes, that's why J must be zero, which means that dominant integration is satisfied. And P will be zero, and the energy is just the parameter e, but e can be arbitrary. Yeah, so Poisson mass is quite interesting in that sense. Of course, I mean, I will uh, omit the technical details to say why this actually technically not really a counter example, but yeah. But you know that, okay, this has been proved by Xing Yao, yeah, the first proof by minimal surface and then return Barnick, and then a lot of people have done different cases. And then in particular, uh, the reasons proved by Bray Castle's current stern and then, uh, Actually, means some. I mean, as uh, actually, cast cast uh, Demetrius told in the talk that it's actually just a resemblance of uh, old proof by Jensiewski and Kijowski about the Hamilton function. But then I want to tell you that uh, actually the spin approach, as we can see from the paper by written in the introduction, actually he uses the concept of harmonic coordinate as well. Yeah, and moreover, <coughs> I would say Bartlett is the first one to really use harmonic coordinate to put uh, to put positive mass theorem. He have been able to show that the energy is greater than the integration of uh, scalar curvature. 
So that's why he has proved Boson must have in that sense. But anyway, I mean, that's a lot of proof. It's a very interesting field with a very rich history. So now you may say, oh man, why do you suddenly talk about something in global? Right? We were talking about just a cube. Why, why suddenly we talk about Boson must film in a global sense? Then I want you to take this chance to introduce some of my other work. So with a Hertz and Mel, we generalize, so-called generalize a result of Mel in 2002, which is Boson must corners. So what have we really generalized in the following sense? We sacrificed certain topological generality, but we have the flexibility of the quantity that we concern. For example, this quantity, uh, sorry, this inequality holds true without any assumption on the curvature and the mean curvature differences. So that's why, again, sacrifice topology to gain some flexibility in the quantity. And then uh, let me introduce that, uh, sorry, because I, uh, let me introduce So G minus and G plus, there's C2 up to a certain boundary. Outside G plus is asymptotically flat, while G minus and G plus, they induce the same metric on the boundary. So that's why the metric is Lipschitz, but the curvature cannot be defined on the boundary, right? It's only Lipschitz. So that's why, but uh, uh, Mel Pangzi has shown that the difference of the mean curvature really is the, I mean, it symbolizes the positivity of the scalar curvature. Okay, so the first part. And then later, uh, in subsequent work, we generalize it to the, okay. Uh, oh, because it is for using the harmonic set method, harmonic level set method, we have to make sure the level set itself doesn't, to be a, doesn't close up to be a sphere. We want it to be a plane, so that we can slice up. Yeah, slice, sorry, slice up, slicing, hold the space time. But I mean, it is the, oh, I forgot the, uh, the topology itself tells that, oh, I forgot the, the very nice explanation. It is by some principle, but wait a minute. Level set cannot be closed. Yep, that is true. But let me think about it. Well, then could help me, right? Because we discussed this just in the yesterday. <laughs> I mean, it's, sorry. I mean, this the, the, the answer. Is, we just discussed it yesterday. We did. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, this is a different. Group. No, I mean, it's. Just, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's such. Oh, I'm just in the. Okay, I don't know how to say this very clearly, but you may give a nicer answer than mine. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not that it could be compact. It's a, a level set. The level set could have topology that gives it bad violet characteristics. Something like that. Oh yeah, because for for right. the... I mean, the point is the the Euler characteristic shows up in in the formula, and I think the point is that topological division means that you're not going to get the yeah for this a, part a bad sign in there. Yeah, I we're think. Uh, no. Yeah, for this part, we have to have uh, certain control on the other characteristics. That's what we don't want. As I said, yeah, we don't want that to be. But your answer is that will not happen anyway. Okay. I have to think about this. I certainly forgot. I mean, I have used it a lot of times. I even forgot how to say it. Yeah. <laughs> I just take it for granted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So can we move on? I mean, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can say sorry about it. Yeah, I just certainly forget. <laughs> okay. Then we extend this to the space time scenario. So there is not only concerning the metric itself, but this time we concern also the k. So this time gk, of course, with respect to c2, c1, up to the boundary. And then, of course, the outside g plus k plus is asymptotically flat. Well, g minus g plus is the symmetric on the boundary. And this time, the topological assumption, again, we sacrifice some of this. But then we have this more general quantity, uh, equal inequality. As we can tell that, of course, mu and j is as usual. And then the jump condition here was so up, the jump condition. This is the h and the pi. So in particular, if mu is greater than of j, which is the condition holds, and if the jump of mean curvature is greater than equal to the jump of the pi new one form, 
n if equal p equals zero, and m is topological R three, which means no boundary, and can be isometrically embedded into R three one. So this is the case, but then it is not sufficient for us to use. So that's why we have this part. This is about with corners, with corners, which means because in a, in the formulation of males, so the surface we have to assume is smooth, but this time. So that's why I'm going to emphasize one point. That is for the uh, requirement number three, because it's smooth surface, we can always identify the normal normal bundle to have the same coordinates, so they will be Lipschitz. But if it's not smooth, for example, if we are considering a polyhedron or simply a cube, so inducing the symmetry is not enough. We also have to consider again normal direction. So that's why I have to assume g minus g plus the Lipschitz are cos sigma. We cannot do it just by identifying the normal bundle. And there exists a, again the same conclusion holds. And then now, of course, I mean most of you can guess how it can be used. So, okay. Oh no, it is not. It is a piecewise move boundary. Piecewise move boundary. So that's why the number three condition. We cannot just identify the partial t direction as Pangji has done in CO. Uh, in the CO to paper. Yeah, just induce the symmetric because we can easily identify the normal direction. Yeah, so that's the slice difference. Okay, so that's why I have to separate into two different slides. Yeah, with corners with corners. Yeah, okay, so just continue. At this moment, from number two, we can already tell that the bunch of M is isometrically as the same as the one in the uh, rectangular prism in Euclidean space. That's important. So that, again, by the Based on Poisson's field, with corners, with corners, we just patch them up. We just patch them up. Then all together, of course, outside the Euclidean, and the jump condition by the energy, we know that it satisfies all the conditions that we need. Then we can tell that the whole thing can be embedded into Minkowski space. In particular, the manifold itself is in Minkowski space. So that's the end of the Daijo G. Yep. And now I would like to answer Martin's question. At this part, Hamiltonian formulation. I mean, for the reference, you can see the paper by Hawking and Horace. Yeah. And then let omega GK be a compact initial set with boundary sigma. Oh, so maybe. The boundary sigma. Then we can form a uh, space time. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. uh, no problem. No problem. There'll be a Riemannian version of this, which will be easier than this, right? Uh, There'll be like Meow's theorem, but with the with the polyhedral hypersurface, uh, yeah, yeah. hypersurface, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, just K U zero. Then if you think yes, you have said. Yeah, but um, huh. I'm wondering, have you thought about like have you thought about using? I mean, you know, Meow's construction. Also, to ask if we want to use conformal deformation or the piecewise smooth singularity, can we do the same trick Something instead of integral formula? Something in that oh, area. Okay, I see. Uh, I this is uh, in terms of regularity. I think it makes sense, but the u, the con the conformal factor will only be w two p because gamma will be l, gamma will be l infinity only, w two p. So a scalar curvature is well defined apart from that set. So give me some time. Some time. Just move It still may not be piecewise. I mean, this is because a male's construction, the conformal deformation, makes sure that the scavenger is really well defined point wisely everywhere. But if you use this level, say G is Lipschitz, right? Then for the regularity of the PD, we can only assume W2P for the solution, which means that it cannot be classically defined. When scavenger cannot be classically defined on the uh, hypersurface piecewise smooth singularity. So, so my answer at this moment is no. But I have to check it more carefully. Yeah. But at this moment, I would say no. Right. Just by. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I forgot to uh, thank you for reminding me. The space I'm coming currently, which means that uh, of course this satisfies the uh, Laplacian U plus chase K times the normal gradient U equals zero. It's just solving the PDE. Move for the boundary, it has to say so U minus X1 in some weighted space. For example, in C1 over Q for simplicity. It, it means asymptotically to X1. Asymptotically to X1. So actually, uh, exactly the idea by uh, Barnick. Yeah, just one global. So that's why this is uh, only, so the is only W2P. And at the boundary, it will show up those terms. I mean, I mean, uh, piecewise, right, there's move. I mean, inside is move, outside is move. But across the boundary, it is only W2P. Yeah. But again, when we do the integral formula separately, then they will have this term showing up. Yeah, and that will be sufficient for integral formula. And that's why we can use this to prove the, instead of Mel's approach, because of integral formula, with integral, then we always have some extra flexibility of the regularity. So that's an important observation of this. Okay. Is it, is it okay? Okay, yeah. Good. So now, uh, to answer Martin's question, that is the Hamiltonian formulation, go back to here. We can form a space time here. So actually, Martin may be more familiar with this with me because it's physics paper, yeah. I just, I just copied that, yeah, yeah. So this is the uh, Hamilton formation. This is omega bar all together. The boundary all together, we call it the sigma bar. Sorry, let me put it here. Omega bar is a whole space time. The boundary here is sigma bar. How we can form this is that by so-called deforming this transversely in this direction, so-called partial t equal to vn plus w. So w is a shift vector which is tangential to the omega, say, let me use this color. Say W is a shift vector, and then we have the Vn, V is a lapse function. And then in here is a time unit normal of omega and omega bar. Then further assume that the omega meets the sigma bar orthogonally. Then we can have this. The gravitational contribution of the Hamiltonian is defined as follows. So we can tell that mu and j shows up naturally. H and pi nu shows up naturally in this sense, in terms of energy, right? So they show up natural. I mean, for me, it's natural in terms of physics formulation. So that's why, okay, I, I told you to remember, pi will show up a lot of times in this talk. So correspondingly, we can tell that mu and j is a one free vector. H and pi nu is a one free vector. So we call in dominant condition, which thing the manifold itself is mu greater than normal j, Correspondingly, the boundary, we just have to assume the mean curvature is greater than the norm of this. Yeah. In particular, why you say sometimes it's chain, sometimes it's a pi tensor, right? In the uh, in the in the proof of diagonality, this is because if you think about pi nu nu, it's actually. So that's why sometimes it chase K, sometimes it's, uh, it depends on the direction you're eating. I mean, the pioneer one form you're eating, which direction the matter, yeah. I mean, is, is it good enough or, okay. Good. So now, uh, deja vu, we go back to Gauss bonnet theorem. Because I want to emphasize the, the interesting points of the diagonality. So for the, uh, we can tell that if the sigma G is uh, given, it is not, it is, uh, N and SC have a non-negative scalar curvature, N and SC. Then we can tell the integral of the Gauss, uh, sorry, integral of the Judas curvature is bounded right, from this inequality, uh, for this equality, sorry, sorry, this equality. I mean, on the other hand, we can say that if the Judas curvature is very big, of all the integral very big, then the uh, sigma, I mean, the surface itself cannot be N and SC. So what happens in high dimensions? So when you see this as C0 characterization of the dominant condition, right? This is also telling you that what happens on the boundary affects what happens inside. So it is the same spirit. What happens on the boundary affects what happens inside. And that's why I mentioned this here. This is a conjecture by Gromov. So uh, if mg is a compact remaining level with scalar bounded from below, then there exists a lambda depending only on the bound you have assumed and the intrinsic geometry on the boundary only such that the integral of the main curvature is bounded. There's a conjecture, and there are several results on this. First of all, 
And then this is answered in the terms of filling. So it's also concerned about the data set. So like what Zhong San has mentioned today. But this time we talk about huh. oh yeah, it can be negative. So for example, you can consider uh the comparison model case would be uh a hyperbolic space as usual. Yeah. Yes. So this time, but uh also because uh in Zhong San's talk, you talk about sigma, gamma, and h. But this time, because we also consider the initial data sets, so that's why you have the extra two terms alpha and beta. And alpha beta actually they stand for so I have a separate in the two parts, right? Sigma, gamma, alpha, you you may say it's an MGK restricted on the boundary. And then H, this time again is a mean curvature. Beta is a corresponding one form, pi nu with respect to the tangential direction. So we can tell the definition. The filling is as follows. Again, mean curvature stands for the pullback of the mean curvature. And then chase sigma of alpha I means chase sigma k, uh, chase sigma k. And then for the pullback of k nu is a beta. This is the meaning of this filling. So we have the definition of space time bucket data sets in the space time initial data set filled in. So, I mean, there are some partial results. First of all, Xi Wang Wei Zhu and Xi Wang Wei, they have found that under certain conditions, either the integral mean curvature is big enough or the point wise mean curvature is big enough, then really there cannot exist a filling of NSC. Okay. And then, uh, and then a very, I would say a very, for me, it's very good result is that Xi Wang Wei has proved that if we ignore the mean curvature assumption, just give you a gamma, I mean, the metric itself, you can overextend it to a reminder metric with positive curvature within the boundary. Oh, sorry, within the, yeah, within the boundaries, I mean, yeah, all, yeah, here. So Amel had made use of this fact to prove the following, which means the sigma with the boundary of some complex n dimensional manifold. So given any reminder metric on sigma, there would exist a constant such as if the minimum of the mean curvature is greater than this certain number, then there really do not exist an NSC field in. So this is uh, very interesting, but then I won't, I won't talk about the proof today here. I just want to say, okay, because now we have the concept of uh, Hamiltonian formulation, we now have the concept of this boundary dominant condition vector, the boundary energy vector, H and pi nu, then one may expect the following filling conjecture. One may expect this. I mean, for me, I would expect this. I don't know you. Yeah, but I mean, MGK be a companion to the set, satisfying certain uh, lower bound of the energy condition. Then this is a lambda dependently on, of course, the lower bound, and G and K such as the integral of the norm of this vector would be bounded. And then it turns out that, I mean, partially it should, I mean, at least for some of the situation, one can generalize the results of Xi Wang Wei and Xi Wang Wei Zhu. And one just thing thing is that because in a Xi Wang Wei's and Xi Wang Wei Zhu's paper, they separate the case for uh, Scalature bundle from below and scalature bundle from some, uh, uh, sorry, non negative scalature and scalature bundle from some negative number because they are trying to compare the Euclidean space and Hubble space separately. But if you use this idea of MGK as initial set, then uh, results, if you plug in K to the G as we have discussed, then we can recover both Ks in one single theorem. So there's one good thing about this point of view. So here we can tell that if h minus f, again f is just the uh, let me just version, but it shows that it's a pullback of the pineal, the pullback of the pineal. So that's why it makes sense again that between the boundary energy cannot be too much. Otherwise, it cannot emit a filling of dominant condition. And then on the other hand, recently, three weeks ago by a paper of uh, Wildot, he showed that if we consider spin filling, then they can use a direct operator to establish the non-existence of Domination condition filled in. So it's a spy spinner, but I don't know much about that, so yeah, I cannot cover that. I will skip the first part. And then again, Gauss Bonnet theorem. For sigma 2G, we have Gauss Bonnet theorem, as here. Then we can tell that because, for example, I would say that we have simple topology, the surface itself is just a disk, then the 2 pi chi sigma would just be 2 pi. And here we can tell by a classical theorem that. For any, for any curve, I mean smooth curve in a Euclidean space, then the integral of the geodesic curvature would be 2 pi. So we can imply these results. So the integral of Gauss curvature of the geodesic curvature in the Euclidean space and the, sp and the manifold itself. So, I mean, uh, some experts here must know that's what I'm going to talk about. First of all, if Gauss curvature is non-negative, then the difference 
of the integral of the geodesic curvature is no negative. Again, what happens in high dimensions? That is about quasi local mass that Anna was talking about yesterday. So, relativity is different from Newtonian mechanics. Local mass cannot be well defined, at least cannot be easily defined. So, by Hamilton formulation, with the choice of uh, mu j action power, you chose dot with the vector, say dot with the vector, one zero, a time like vector. Then, Brown and York has defined the following bound mass, which is the integral of the difference of the mean curvature of H0 and H. So H again stands for the mean curvature itself, with respect to G, and H0 stands for the mean curvature when it is embedded into the Euclidean space. So that's why it's bound on mass. And then for one yard mass, they have to choose a more general choice of the timeline vector. So, uh, for, but it is quite difficult to explain here, so I will just skip this, sorry about it. Yeah, and then, but then I just want to mention, we can actually choose a null vector. We can choose a null vector. Instead of one zero, we can choose one one, and then we can arrive at this formula. So it's a direct comparison of the boundary energy vector. This is a direct comparison. So I call it W. Yeah, I call it W. And then uh, I want to mention, okay, for binary mass, under what conditions wait, binary wait, mass? Wait, 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 okay. Are you saying that Is it now possible to, because the one year obviously, like one of the defects. Yeah, one of the one. If the mean coach is now, then you can't define it. Right? Mean coach is now. Oh, no, I mean, I would say to you just for an easy comparison. I'm not, I mean, to be honest, it may not have such a strong significance. I would say it is easier to show this positive, that I would say. Because if you prove the one now mass, you have to look for the embedding, and then you have to solve the gen equation. And then you have to use a spinner to solve the Poisson mass theorem. But now, if you use this quantity, then just by space time Poisson mass theorem corner, then you can show it is positive. In this sense, it is relatively useful. But in terms of physical significance, of course, Wang and Yao has a series of knots. I mean, the Mutao Wang has a series of knots to show why Wang Yao is the best. So, I mean, to be honest, this is not as good as Wang Yao is. But, yeah. No, but this, this has a nice uh, property, right? This, uh, this you can define when the space time. Yes, it can be defined, but to show it is positive, you just have to, I mean, we have to make sure this part is positive. I mean, H minus pi nu is positive. In a certain sense, if you remember here, H minus pi nu, pi, uh, pi nu itself is only chase k. So that's why if this to be positive, which means it is uh, actually more than now, the, this is more restrictive in a certain sense. It's the same, right? Okay, but... yeah, it's actually more restrictive. Yeah. So in that sense, it's worse, it's, yeah, it's worse than one yeah, that, so that my answer is no. That's why my answer is this is not as good as one-yard mass. But it's kind of confusing to say, you know, you're talking about the null vector, so I thought that... Yeah, but it's really a null vector, right? One, one. Yeah, no, I know, but I thought I, I understood something else. Okay, yeah, sorry for confusion. No, no, no. no. Yeah, okay, yeah. And then, okay, so, so again, the, the key point here is that the norm of the boundary energy vector can be directly compared. I would say this is the significance of this quantity. Okay, so I will use it as a transition. So for example, I, will ha I have to mention the result by Xi and Tam. So for the mean curvature is positive on the boundary, within which the discussion is not negative. Of course, to make sure the boundary is making sense, we have to say that the sigma can be isometrically embedded into the Euclidean space. Okay, then we can define boundary mass. And if it's strictly convex hypersurface, then we can use a bartlett xi Tam construction to show that it is not negative. In particular, if the dimension is free, one can show that the boundary mass of the of the coordinate sphere will oppose to the atom energy. Okay, so there is a part. And then correspondingly, when W is positive, so we can tell if within which the dominant condition is satisfied, and then on the boundary, again, boundary strict dominant condition. So it is so somehow a direct generalization, I would say in this sense. We can use the same approach, but the sheet construction to show this part is not negative. Oh, H not H not is the micro which right? is embedded into R n. H not. Yeah. So this uses the uh, this uses the space time PMT with corners. Yes. Corners, but I thought that was three dimensional. 
Oh yeah, so that's why ah, I have to mention that. Yeah, okay, when Omega is spin, then one can use the result by Shibuya. Shibuya has a result on archive, has a has a preprint on archive, which is based on the results by Danny and his collaborator. I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly. Philippe Laforge, is that? Yeah, yeah. So he generalizes this result to the space-time scenario. So if that is true, I mean, I mean, actually, I mean, I, I believe that is true because the computation is uh, we, we can follow. So if it's been, then we can tell that it's okay. because it's space time person with corner as well, but in the spin condition. Yes. Okay, so this doesn't use your. your I mean, for 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 three dimension, right, you can right, use right. the original or Shibuya. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So that's why I say the topological yeah. condition number four. Right. Okay, cool. Then uh, there's one thing I want to mention. There's a limit for the bundle mass. And at this scenario, I want to mention this part. This is the last part of the talk. I oh, the second last, sorry. So localization mass on polygons, it as follows. Again, gauss bonnet theorem, deja vu. This is here. Well, how you can play with gauss bonnet theorem? Of course, we can, again, this time on polygon. So we can tell that the, uh, the integral of gauss curvature, you put the last line here. It's a negative of the integral of curvature and then the difference of the angles. Because Q minus 2 pi is just the sum of the Q side of the polygon, no matter what the polygon is, like Q side of the polygon. So we can tell, again, if the gas curvature is non negative, then the last line is non negative. And this time, what I want to say is the following a result by Mel and uh, Anna, you can tell that, okay, just exactly the same way you can tell. Just uh, the Gauss curvature, uh, geodesic curvature replaced by mean curvature. Then we can have this one. Of course, I mean, as, as Mel's mentioned in the, in the talk, I mean, in April, if we restrict itself on a compact polyhedron, it's coordinate dependent. If we take a limit, it's actually a positive energy, which is geometrically invariant. And then I would like to note that the polyhedron need not be convex here. So that's why there is a hope that dihedral uh, rigidity doesn't need a uh, convexity assumption. But I mean, of course, I mean, we, I mean, I'm not able to show that yet, but I mean, this is a hope, yeah. And then correspondingly, if we add a pi term to be there, and if we assume the damage condition, then by the space time plus mass theorem, we can tell that this quantity, because the first line will, cup, will approach the energy, the second line will approach to the P, that's why by space time plus mass theorem, we can tell this is not negative, okay. Then finally, it's, again, it's a, uh, answer the question by Martin. So how can we say Dijewicity with the space-time PMT? How can we say this? So with Lockham's construction of the PSC island, and Charlie has mentioned, okay, Dijewicity implies the remaining positive mass theorem. Correspondingly, with Lockham's construction of the strict normal condition island, then the Dijewicity implies the space-time positive mass theorem. In particular, in dimension three, because of the topological construction by Jane equation, by Xing and Yao, and the construction of the classification of topology by Anderson, Daho, Galloway, and, okay, yeah, yeah, and Pollack. Then we can tell the topology is, is really good so that we can apply the dihedral assumption to say that, okay, otherwise, if we con concent uh, concentrate all the energy, sorry, okay, let me draw it here, take the last minute. So this is the Mu greater than J island, which outside is completely Euclidean. The second law from K equals zero is very good, but inside it has strict dominant condition. But because it's a delta, I right, it's Euclidean, so that I can draw a big cube to enclose it. So that's why, okay, I mean, if, uh, sorry, if E less than P, then we have this island. But by the diagonal are some, then we know that's, oh sorry, by the Dijewski conjecture, we know that it must be Minkowski, or at least we know that mu equals j equals zero. That's why there's a contradiction. That's why E cannot be less than P. So that's the idea. Okay. And then at the end, I want to mention that uh, if we consider the charge inducer data sets, just like MG and E, where this time E is a electric vector field, a uh, divergence free electric field, then by the charge on the functions proposed by Bray, Hurst, Cassius, Kirby, and Zhang, then all the ideas, all the things that we mentioned today, can be applied. Say for example, we can talk about the diagonality for a charged polyhedra, for uh, for local for the new quasi local mass for the charged inducer data set, and then for the uh, yeah for almost all the things. So 
just to sum up, uh, sorry, to running over time, but to sum up, what we can see today is that, first of all, dihedral geometry has a very rich content in study of geometry and physics. First of all, it sees your categorization of dominant condition, and it's, it's, uh, shows cases, the relationship between the boundary geometry and the interior geometry. It serves as a localization of mass, and finally, it has a strong implication to the positivity of ADM mass. So thank you for the day. Yeah.